Hey everybody, this is going to be our very first species account. So think of this as the natural history of Virginia possum, how to identify it, uh, and then any of the sign that we'll need to know. So if you need to know this animal's skull, I'll cover it in this uh, video. If you need to know its tracks, if you know its scat or any other, other sign. You should have either printed off the note template that went along with this, or you've got it open in another window, or you're taking notes freehand, uh, but this is really a lecture and you're really uh, taking notes for me, thanks. This is our only marsupial. Remember we talked about marsupials in the last PowerPoint if you are watching these in order. And both of these uh, critters were captured on a camera trap uh, on my property uh, many years ago, actually. So let's talk a little bit about the name Virginia possum. It's called Virginia possum because the first uh, described specimen was from the state of Virginia, uh, probably actually the colony of Virginia, if I think about it. And the, let's say that the word opossum is important because there are critters called possums. So in Australia, in the Associated Islands, they're possums. And here in the New World, in North, Central, and South America, they're opossums. I generally don't say opossum with such a strong emphasis on the O, but uh, whenever I see it in print and it just says possum, it, it really rings uh, incorrect for me. You may notice that on your note template, it has a WDS category that stands for What Did Elbrock Say? So normally, if we were doing this live, we would take a moment now for everyone to have an opportunity to tell me something that was in the book that they're either still confused about or they found particularly interesting. So I'm asking you to do that in writing. Again, that's not something that you're turning in. That's something that you are uh, using as reference for our midterm and then again for our final. You're welcome to shout out any questions to me uh, through uh, email or texting me. Uh, but uh, again, normally this is just done for your own benefit. I'm also asking you to read the blog entries that have the label possum, and there's eight of them. I am not uh, apologizing for the number that you have to read. They're all kind of, of different and worth looking into. This one uh, and a couple of them really talk about the tracks and trails of opossum. Uh, there's a few of them that talk about scavenging behavior. I butchered a deer and put the carcass out in the hedgerow and uh, had a possum and a skunk come very frequently to that. And then there's also a very short one that talks about uh, photographing two possums together in March of 2011. And the only real reason to have two adults together would be uh, mating. So we're looking at the female in the front and that determined look on the male's face there uh, to, to make sure he's with her when uh, she's in heat. All right, let's start with possible identification here for the opossum. So I'm going to say uh, with some confidence that it's pretty difficult to misidentify the opossum. In fact, you might say it's impossible. Uh, I guess when I found this on the internet, I really hoped that it was a joke. Uh, I still have that hope, but I wouldn't put anything past anybody. It's really uh, it's really difficult though to, to mistake the possum for anything else. They are cat size, by the way. Um, here are two photos, and I'm gonna use my arrow here to show you. See this branch in the background? Now look at this photo, see this branch in the background? So one of the advantages of having a camera trap is it'll take multiple images from exactly the same location. And now, in order to compare their sizes directly, they both need to be the same distance from the camera. So if you look at this big leaflet right here, that's a poison ivy leaflet, you can see it's also visible in this picture. It's a little redder, uh, the fall has, has progressed a little bit more, but both animals are just behind that leaflet, so they're the same distance from the camera. Their uh, size can be accurately determined here. 
Now, we really do need to talk about identification just to make sure, you know, that, that we have it. I had a possum get hit by a car one fall in front of my house, and I do want to point out you should always wear gloves when handling a dead animal. Look at that white face, which really is a key characteristic for possum. But what I want to focus in on right now are those ears. Look at how delicate and dainty those ears are. I mean, they're just little flower petals. They're just absolutely perfect looking. The problem, though, is is that they're naked. So if you're an animal that's supposed to survive the winter here in New York State, having a hat where it doesn't cover your ears is really not a good plan. So these ears sometimes can suffer from frostbite. And uh, we'll try to look at that as we go through these and, and see some of the other, other images. I'm not saying possums are not adapted to winter at all. They're considered a fur bearer in New York State. They do have fur, and maybe we should get this out of the way. The difference between hair and fur really is only quality. So once it's thick and luxurious, we call it fur. If it's not, we call it hair. But, but chemically, they're the same thing. It's a low-quality fur. It's not the thing that mom dreams of, a possum fur coat for Mother's Day. But it does, uh, it does do the trick and does keep the possum warm. The problem is that in addition to having their ears exposed, they have their fingers and toes exposed and their tail as well. Now, I inherited this photo from Bill. Uh, if you watch that PowerPoint, you know what I'm talking about. The only thing that I know about this picture is that's FLCC in the background. So we've got uh, a possum on campus, and other than that, I don't know anything. <laughs> Sorry. I need to give you a vocabulary word here. What is it called when you use that tail like it's a hand? Well, the term is prehensile. And if you've never heard it said out loud, it's pronounced prehensile. Sometimes I hear people say prehensile. I, don't, I won't correct you, but prehensile is how it's said. And the definition of prehensile is I use it like a hand. And please notice that I am not using the word tail in the definition. So elephants have a prehensile nose, their trunk. Manatees have prehensile lips. Uh, and uh, I think we've just about run out of what you can have that's prehensile. There's a close look at the tail. This is that roadkill again that was by my house. And it does look rat-like. I get it why people think possums are related to rats. They're just not. It's round and uh, it comes to a nice point like that and you can see that it's got all those scales on it. Now if you ever did look at one of these up close there are short hairs on it. When I say it's a naked tail I just mean it appears to be naked. It's like calling someone bald even though they've got a few hairs on the side of their head. Okay. Now because it is naked or nearly naked there's some of those uh, little bristly hairs that you can see here. It really succumbs to frostbite very easily. Elbrock talks about this in the book, that they, in the northern uh, climate here, you can find possums that have lost their, their tail tip. Now, I have no idea how much tail was missing from this one. This is a different roadkill that I picked up than the last one. And can you tell me what this is right here? Yep, that's bone. That's a piece of vertebrae sticking out. So kind of gross, and I'm sure it hurt. Uh, but these guys live with this all the time. Another roadkill, you ask? Yes, I pick up roadkill a lot. This one not only lost the, the tip of his tail to frostbite, but instead of it falling off completely, it was just dangling like this disgusting, dead, gross thing on the back of his tail. So imagine that this is a, a male trying to find a mate, and he's got this gross thing hanging off the end of his tail every time he's trying to talk up the ladies. Uh, probably wasn't, wasn't uh, very helpful. I uh, do need to point out to you guys, uh, it's not super important, but just a little pet peeve of mine, that for whatever reason, and I don't know the reason, the base of a possum's tail is black like this, and a lot of people think that that's frostbite. Again, I would like to show you that the frostbite is going to occur at the tip of the tail, where the tail is farthest away from the heat, from the furnace. Make sense? So as we go through this PowerPoint, be looking at the rest of the possum pictures and see if you can see black at the base of the tail on all of them. Okay, so 
uh, if I had to give you this test question, uh, you would identify this as a possum, and then I could ask you a second question, which is uh, old or young. And if those are my only two choices, I would have to call this an older possum. See how the tail is sort of blunt here at the end? We're missing some to frostbite. Notice how the ears are very black, and they've got a little bit of pinkish color on the, on the edge here. They're frostbitten. So this is a possum that's been through at least one New York winter. In the wintertime, they retreat to dens to escape the coldest of the weather because they're really not built for the harshest cold. What's interesting, though, is they don't dig their own dens. They'll steal them from, let's say, woodchucks like this one right here. They'll live in culverts under the road. I had one living under my shed for a winter. Uh, we've had them in our garage. So they're going to take over a burrow, but they're not going to create one. The best that they'll actually do is bring vegetation into their den, either for insulation or for, for, for bedding. Uh, this is... Uh, the wad of vegetation, here's the tail, and the possum is walking uh, directly away from the camera here, and I would like to point out that that is using the tail like a hand, so that's, that's our definition of prehensile there. If we look at the range map for the possum, uh, we see that they don't get very much farther north than uh, where we live here in New York. So if I can orient you here, that's Lake Ontario, and just on the other side of Lake Ontario is the northernmost range for possum here in the here in the east. So I can get in a car, I'm sitting here in Seneca Falls, and I could drive north of the lake, I could be to the north side of Lake Ontario in a couple hours, and then drive another, say, half hour, 45 minutes north, and everybody that I would meet would say, ooh, what's a possum, eh? Like they know about them because they've heard about them but not because they see them in their neighborhood. So this is a good indication that we are about as rough as you possibly can get uh, to, be a, to be a possum. Uh, the weather is what I'm referring to. So if possums can't handle uh, rough weather, uh, real intense conditions, how do we have possums out here in the, in the West? Well, they didn't swim there. They didn't cross the desert, and they, they, they didn't cross the mountains, at least not on their own. Actually, possums were brought to California on purpose. Possums were brought as a food source when the gold rush of 1849 first happened. People from all over the United States and other places in the world, for that matter, came to look for gold. They were called the 49ers. And we've got a football team named after that. Well, the ones from the south brought possums with them. It's probably a good time to also tell you that uh, the possums that are here in New York State are pretty recent advances as well. I don't think anybody drove them up in a covered wagon, but they have been steadily making their way north for the, the last century or so because we've made changes to the landscape to allow them to do that. This is a really big point, so I want to make sure that everybody uh, takes a minute to jot some notes down about this. Possums, even 60, 70 years ago, were rare in the Finger Lakes. Possums 100 years ago would have been almost unheard of in the Finger Lakes because uh, possums were still making their way north. So what did we do to encourage them? Well, all the roads that we built, all the buildings that we built, the sidewalks, the parking lots, all of those retain heat much better than the ground does. Maybe you've had an experience where you've looked out the window in the morning and snow is covering your lawn, but the driveway is perfectly clear. And you know you didn't shovel the driveway. That's because the driveway stayed a little bit warmer at night. So that's true of all of the man-made structures that I mentioned. So we did warm things up enough to give possums a chance to, to start moving north. In addition, those roads also provide lots of food. So not just the roadkill that you can see, but all the bugs and insects and uh, I guess bugs are insects, aren't they? Reptiles and amphibians that get squished on the road, those are all food sources for the possum. 
In addition, food sources that we've created, garbage, uh, compost piles, agriculture, cat food that gets left out on the, on the porch, all of those are good food sources for the possum and help them survive in the winter months. Finally, we've provided them with shelter. Remember all of those things that I told you they use for shelter? Woodchuck burrows. But, but then I also mentioned culvert pipes underneath my shed, in our barn, uh, in a dumpster. All of those are places where, where possums will be able to hide, and all of those are places that did not exist till humans really changed the landscape. To the point where possums are incredibly common in New York State now. This, if you're not familiar, is from the hunting syllabus that the New York State DEC puts out every year. I took this from the web version of it, and it shows that possums, along with fox and raccoon and weasels, have a hunting season that goes from October 25th to February 15th. That's a long time. And in addition, they have no bag limits. So that means you could shoot as many possums as you wanted, day or night, every single day of the season. A little bit of different rules down on Long Island. For some reason, they open six days later and are open 10 days longer. New Long Island has many season dates that are different than the rest of the state. Anyway, this kind of generous season where it's open for a very long time and has no bag limit tells me that New York State is not worried about losing its possums. So that means we, we've got lots of them. Well, if they're so prevalent, how come you don't see them? How come normally when you see them, they're just taking a nap on the side of the road? Well, the big reason for that is possums are nocturnal. That doesn't mean that a possum out during the day is sick or crazy or whatever. Nocturnal just means they spend the majority of their time out at night. The other term that I want to use to describe the possum is opportunistic. Opossums are opportunistic. And opportunistic just means that they will eat whatever they have the opportunity to. So, you know, you married a good woman when she lets you bring a roadkill home and throw it in the hedgerow to see what will come and eat it. So that's what this is. It's a dead deer. I tossed it out there, put a camera on it. And the only reason I'm using this picture is because I think this is the biggest possum that I've ever taken a picture of. Like this is Arnold Schwarzen possum right here. It's not a great picture, but it shows that he's scavenging uh, a deer. It will eat insects, as I mentioned. They dig up grubs. They'll eat eggs. They eat ticks, as every Facebook user knows, because you've gotten that damn uh, meme a million times, which is a bit misleading. Uh, and, and they'll eat uh, plant material as well. Well, we can't talk about pa possums without talking about playing dead. And I have ac actually never seen this happen myself. Uh, maybe some of you have. Usually when a student tells me a story about a possum playing dead, the story starts out with one time, my dog. Because possums playing dead, there's a couple, couple uh, interesting uh, parts about this. First, despite what you learned in Over the Hedge, that documentary, Possums cannot just play dead whenever they wish to. Playing dead is probably the wrong term for it. We really should call it fainting. What happens is as a possum gets stressed out, its blood vessels constrict, it reduces the amount of oxygen to the brain, and the possum passes out. Now, it may seem like a silly defense to you, but I can assure you it works. If it didn't work, we wouldn't have any possums left now, would we? It probably doesn't work every single time, but animals are built to be suspicious of things that don't act the way they're supposed to. So your dog grabs a possum, gives it a tiny shake, and the possum goes limp. And the dog's like, whoa, 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 I didn't even kill it. This thing must be sick. I got to leave it alone. That's the theory behind what goes through their head. We, we know that dogs uh, probably don't think exactly, exactly like we think they do. Once they relax like this and play dead, they also uh, exude, uh, sometimes they'll defecate, they'll exude from their anal gland, and so they smell horrible as well. The other thing we need to talk about is the pouch or the marsupium, and I apologize for so many dead pictures here. Always wear gloves when handling dead animals. I wish that I had taken a before picture here, but I, but I didn't. This is a possum that I pulled off the road one spring 
tossed it in the freezer until I had some time to deal with it. And what you're seeing here, if I can get my pointer live, is I've already distended that pouch. I've already grabbed the lip of the pouch, pulled it down so you can see what's inside of it. I wish I showed you it when the pouch was still closed to here. Maybe I'll find another dead possum this spring. Um, fingers crossed. And uh, I'll see, see what I can do for you guys. Um, the fancy name for the pouch is the marsupium. So marsupials get their name from the pouch. And what you're looking at is all of those little pink pieces in there. Those are all baby possums. I took one out, uh, put it in my hand here, and this is a possum that had been born. This is not a fetus. I can understand if you look at this and think, wow, this guy's got a long time to grow yet. Uh, but they're born super undeveloped like this. A six foot tall kangaroo will give birth to a one inch long baby, or joey as they call them. These are also called joeys. Any, any newborn uh, marsupial is called a joey. And look how underdeveloped they are. They've got no hair on them. Their eyeball is just a blue dot underneath the skin, not even developed yet. But you should be able to see that their front claws are fully developed. That's because they're born from the from the the birth canal, and then they have to swim through the mother's fur up into the pouch. So they use their front legs for that. That they they spend their entire time inside the womb, developing those front arms, those big guns, so that they can get their way into the pouch. Let me give you some numbers here. I hope this picture is okay for you. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go to the next one so, so you don't get too grossed out. But let me give you some numbers, okay? So first, possum babies are born the size of a honeybee. Let me say that one more time so you can write that down. Possum babies are born the size of a honeybee. And she can have 25 of them. Well, you can have lots of them because you don't put very much effort into any one of them. Inside of her pouch, though, there are not 25 teats. There's not 25 nipples. Do you remember what Elbrock said? 13. I know 13 seems strange. I'm also used to thinking of nipples in even numbers. So they've got 13 nipples in there. So if she does have 25 babies or any number higher than 13, the first 13 that go into the pouch latch onto a nipple and they don't let go. This becomes their umbilical cord because they need so much nutrition they can't drink half the milk and share half the milk with their brother or sister even if they had the brain to even think about that. They latch on and don't let go for, for weeks at a time. Now because her babies are born so underdeveloped she's barely pregnant. She's only pregnant for 12 and a half days. So when you look at this possum right here, um, this was a picture back in May a few years ago, and when I ask this question in class and say describe this possum's condition, you see the big bulge here, many students will say pregnant. But she, she doesn't even show when she's pregnant. She's got bees in her for crying out loud. So there's no chance for her to bulge like this until the babies have already been born, are in the pouch, and start to develop there. In fact, even if she has 13 babies that go into the pouch, she averages more like six or seven that come out of the pouch. So if you're a biologist, which number is more important to you? The 25 she has that are born, the 13 that get started, or the six or seven that finish? If you said the six or seven, you're right. It's not how many you start with, it's how many you end up with that's most important to a biologist. So this possum is not pregnant. She's got a pouch full of growing babies. By the time May comes along, um, they should be getting pretty big. Now, when they leave the pouch, they look like baby possums. They don't look like fetuses anymore. They look like they should have looked when they had come out of the, of the womb full term. I do want to point out the black at the base of the tail on this possum. I took these pictures from uh, a website. The guy does animal damage control. Somebody called him because there was a possum living up in their attic. He went up there and got rid of them. Um, have you ever worked in insulation? I know it's hot in attics, but do you know how itchy that stuff is? I guess if you got guns like that, you show them off even if, even if you're working in the insulation. 
Okay. I so much want to see a possum carrying its babies on its back. I see it all the time. I can Google pictures of it, but I really want to see it in real life. The closest I've ever gotten was a picture on my camera trap uh, from my side hedgerow there. But eventually the possums get so big that they're no longer drinking mom's milk. They're no longer in the pouch, but they're still hanging out with mom as they're learning to get food and survive. Great, let me pause for just a second and see if there's anything else I wanted to tell you about the possum. I'm pretty sure I hammered through most of the stuff between what I just told you and your book. Uh, you've got a lot of information there. Okay, I really need you to know the possum by its front track and its rear track. I took these pictures on our side uh, porch a couple of years ago. And they do show both fronts and rears. Let's go back and forth a little bit. This is the roadkill that I picked up. This is a front foot. Notice that it's got five toes, and when the possum puts its front foot on the ground, those five toes all kind of sprawl out. Here's a good picture of it. I think about it like a sunburst or a starburst with those toes all sprawling out in a, in a variety of directions. And then the hind foot is absolutely fascinating because instead of having an opposable thumb like, like we do, they've got opposable big toes. So there's their big toe, or sometimes people call it the thumb of their hind foot, which is kind of funny. And you notice that these four toes all go in the same direction. And just like your thumb hangs out to the side, that's, that's this guy. So if we go back to this picture, you can see here's a hind track. There's that big toe, that opposable, and there's those four toes going this way. So what would I write in my notes? Well, I gave you a description of the front and the rear track. I also told you that uh, they have five toes on the front and back. That's always important. And then finally, I'll use the word uh, plantigrade, which is a term that we used before. You can see that they have a heel here, uh, and, they, and they are supposed to work, walk uh, plantigrade, planting their whole foot on the ground. Now let's talk a little bit about how to identify their skull. I will tell you that teaching this online is very different than in the classroom. I don't have a skull to pass around to you guys. Uh, we'll see how, how we can come up with this. But the possum's skull is going to have an omnivore tooth pattern. That means stabbers in the front and grinders in the back. You remember that from that PowerPoint? And the new vocabulary word I need you to know is sagittal crest. The sagittal crest is the ridge on the top of the head. That's where the temporalis muscle connects to the body. Now, in humans, we normally don't have a sagittal crest. But this was one of my students one day that showed up in class on the same day that we were learning possum skulls. So I had to give Noah a shout out here. Here is the sagittal crest. And that temporalis muscle goes past the temple. That's the long one. Connects to the jaw and goes all the way up here and then has to connect to this big, huge ridge. The muscle can't just connect to other muscle. It has to connect to a, to a bone. And then you can see how wide these cheekbones are. Huge space for muscle. That tells me that this guy has a very strong bite. But notice also how pinched in the brain case is here. Possums of all of our mammals in North America have the smallest brain compared to their body size. Marsupials are not super smart. They're still smarter than fish, but as compared to the other mammals, and they're really not that great. That extra space gives them a chance to be stronger. They, they fill up that space with muscle instead of with brain. And uh, this reminds me of my favorite rapper, Fitty Teeth. Uh, possums have more teeth than any other land mammal in North America. And having a lot of teeth is a primitive characteristic. Specialists like cats that eat just meat, man, they have very few teeth. But this guy's got like the Swiss Army knife of teeth, right? He's got all kinds of different teeth for all kinds of different jobs. Cool. Uh, I took all those... Uh, skull pictures from uh, Michigan's uh, animal diversity page. Uh, but I did take this picture right here in my kitchen. And this is a very small possum. 
you can see it's got a very small sagittal crest. You can see how the shadow uh, lays on it here. And you can see that so much of the skull is missing. The whole snout is missing. The Both cheekbones are missing. But it's super easy to still tell that this is a possum because of that pinched-in brain case and that tall sagittal crest there. So I wouldn't do that to you on a test, give you a fragment like that, but I would like to encourage you to not just give up if you find a fragment of, of a bone or a skull, that you really should be able to start uh, piecing these together and, and getting better at it. Cool. Well, this is the question portion, and since we can't do the questions live, if you still have any questions about what I just talked about with the possum, give me a shout out. I've given you my cell phone number. You can text me or you can email me. Either way, I promise I will answer you back. Thank you very much for listening to all of this. I will return with Shrews next.